Hi. Um, good afternoon. So we're back now to chapter six. Um, we covered chapter six uh, in the previous uh, lecture until um, we, we did talk about relative prices versus the average price. So this is the second half, which we don't have a lot more slides to go. Um, so we talk about inflation. We talk about nominal, the, the difference between nominal versus the real value. Um, we talk about base uh, year and things like that. So, but what exactly are the two costs of inflation? For example, you hear about this quote and unquote noise in the price system. What exactly is noise? For example, if you go to McDonald's to buy a Big Mac today, you use a drive through and then uh, and after you make your selection, you say, I would like to have the McDonald's, uh, what is this thing? Um, okay, Big Mac. And then when the when he got done ordering at the, you know, you drive further and then you, you're about to make your payment and they tell you it's like uh, $8 for a Big Mac, you're not going to be happy because you say, oh man, that's a, that's, that's a rip off, you know, because uh, $8 for a Big Mac, I usually pay $5 or less, $4 or less, actually much less than that, right? Um, so in other words, uh, when people are not happy with the price, they think it's too pricey. And that's because there is inflation. Inflation does happen. So inflation obscures the information transmitted by prices and reduces the efficiency of the market system. Then you're not quite trusting the market system. You say, hmm, is it, does it really reflect the true cause of inflation? Now, I remember when I was a teenager living in the country of Singapore, and the new McDonald's uh, just opened up. This is uh, somewhere in the late 70s, uh, early 80s. And um, I remember every weekend I would go to, I would take a bus to go to McDonald's and my meals are very standard. So I would have a Big Mac and a uh, vanilla milkshake and a, and a drink, I think, uh, a french fries, yeah. I don't think I ordered a drink, but just milkshake and Big Mac and french fries. Well, every Saturday, Saturday I did that, and so back then the Big Mac is very big. You know, it takes a while. You have to open your mouth big to consume that Big Mac. You know, it takes a while to finish it. And the milkshake, for that matter, it's so thick. You know, you can turn it upside down and it stays, doesn't fall. You know, so today when you go to McDonald's and get the Big Mac. It is so thin, you could finish it in three or four bites. That's it. What happened? You might say the price costs the same. When I paid for it, back then, you might say, well, it cost $2.50, and today it still costs $2.50. But the price today is not the same as price yesterday, and plus, they make the, the hamburgers a lot more thinner and the buns a lot more thinner. That is inflation. Inflation eats up your money. So what about this? Another example in the true cause of inflation is the distortion of the tax system. Now, we talked about indexing earlier in this chapter. So we say that income tax uh, brackets are usually indexed to CPI. Now, you should be glad that it is being indexed because if it is being indexed means uh, it does take into consideration the possibility of having inflation in the future. So it's being built in. Now, think about it. If it is not built in, let's just say your income is 40000 and then you pay your income tax or let's say, I don't know, just example for the sake of discussion, let's just say 10%. But but you're glad that, you know, this income tax uh, that you're, you're, you're looking at is a real value. Because it, if, if it is a real value, that's, that's really truly how much you should pay, 10%. But if it is much higher, if it is not indexed to CPI, Consumer Price Index, then it might be higher. The nominal value might be higher. Then you might creep into the next bracket, income tax bracket, like 
you might be paying 15% instead of 10%. So for that reason, we're glad that uh, the, you know, the IRS has indexed the income tax brackets that way. However, you know, they're not perfect. They're not going to do it for all, for some reason, you know, yes, for income tax brackets are being indexed with CPI, but when it comes to capital depreciation, the allowance of it, it is, this value is not indexed. So that's not so good. Now, capital depreciation will be things like if you buy a tractor, so the textbook gives the same example, and let's say it costs 10000 and then the next year, uh, when you pay income tax again, if you buy the tractor for a business, there's such a thing called capital depreciation. And each year it depreciates a little bit, so you're allowed to put in uh, in your income tax uh, allow for that depreciation. However, that because of the fact that that capital depreciation allowance is not being indexed, so therefore you lose a little bit because it's, uh, that means it's not, you're looking at the nominal value instead of the, uh, the, the real value. And the last example is shoe leather cost, the cost of economizing on cash. This is an interesting example because in the U.S. you don't experience that as much. Not yet, I hope never. But during the 80s, there, is, uh, there was Latin um, American economic crisis. So that was in the 80s, okay? And so what happened was the pesos lose its val lose, uh, value rapidly over a short period of time. So much so that all these Latin American countries like Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, Argentina, um, you know, all these countries, they all use pesos. pesos. So it, the value of the pesos are loose, not just every day on a daily basis, but also on an hourly basis. It is that bad. And it was such an inflation rate of in the 80, 80 to 90% of inflation rate, which is considered very, very high. Okay, so, hmm. So what people do, what do some of these businesses in Latin, this in Latin American countries uh, do is uh, they, they send their clock to the bank very often. And the reason for doing that is because, uh, the, you know, on a daily basis, whatever they earn, revenues that they earn, they quickly take it and put it to the banks and maybe um, three, four times a day or maybe more regular than that. So much so that they wear out their leather shoe. So therefore you get this expression, shoe leather cost, uh, cost of economizing on cash. So basically what it is, is uh, you don't want to get a whole bunch of cash at the end of the day and put it in the bank. You keep doing it every two hours uh, just to prevent pesos from losing its value. So it is that bad. Um, so again, you know, in the modern economy, we like in the US, we cannot imagine that. But that had happened in other countries as well. So now inflation may also distort the incentive provided by the tax system for people to work, to save, to invest therefore reduce economic growth. So what does that mean? So, you know, if you know there's inflation, again, it eats away your money, it will affect your retirement account, you know, because the money that uh, you originally have, save up, you know, because of inflation, it's, uh, it's become less value now. So, you know, it might change how people want to save, how to work, how to save for retirement or for, education, go to college, or set up families, or getting married, buying a house, all those decisions are being affected by the inflation. So now there are people who lose, there are people who win when there is inflation. So what we call unexpected redistribution of wealth. 
the, the, the term redistribution of wealth means uh, it, every time there's inflation, somebody lose, somebody wins, so the money is flowing from one party to another party. And especially if the inflation is considered unexpected. So we're going to make a chart here, okay, and we're going to say who are the winners and who are the losers for inflation. And we also would add the word unexpected. So that is important. So in other words, uh, if it is unexpected, you don't see it coming, then uh, basically, uh, yeah, the, 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 excuse me, the distribution of wealth will be from workers to employees. So in other words, uh, the workers uh, will be the loser, the employers, your bosses, will be the winners. And why is that? Because you see the money flow this way. When you earn your wages, it's going to flow from employers to you. But when you get it, the value are going to be less because of inflation. So you are, you may, uh, workers are the losers in the unexpected inflation. So our employers are the winners. So there's another party here from lenders to borrowers. Okay, so the lenders will be right here. The borrowers will be right here. So for example, most people, if you buy a house, they take out mortgages. So they have to make payment, monthly mortgage uh, amount to the, to the lenders. So when the lenders get the money, is the value is less. Who are the lenders? The lenders are usually bankers or the banks. That almost seemed seem very odd to talk about the banks being the loser, whereas they should be the one who knows a step ahead of us when it comes to making investment, uh, interest rate, and accumulation of wealth, for example. Uh, see, and all this is because the inflation is considered unexpected. But if the inflation is expected, which a lot of time banks know ahead of time, they have some inklings, they have some predictions, they have some hindsight, they have some intuition, insight that it is coming. So if they know that it is coming, they would adjust it accordingly, the interest rate, so that they are not falling behind. So that is if it is expected. So we'll talk about that later. And then other things will be, uh, yeah, we talked about it before. In, inflation also would affect your long-term planning. When do I want to graduate? Uh, when do I want to retire? And when do I want to make my business investments? So next we want to introduce this uh, equation, which you have seen in the, let's see, we're doing chapter six here. Yeah. You will see this equation a few more times by the end of the semester, yeah. So according to this equation, I'm gonna write it now. Well, it's actually more like an identity. What is real interest rate and what is nominal interest rate? So I'm gonna write R, little r is equal to I minus pi. So this little r here means your real interest rate, okay? And this little i here means nominal. So by now, I expect you to i slash r, that's my short form for interest rate. And the last one, pi here, a Greek letter pi here means inflation rate. Inflation rate. So in other words, uh, the real interest rate is the difference between nominal interest rate and your inflation rate. So, what is the nominal interest rate? The nominal interest rate is something that you're very familiar with. If I mention it, you know it. If you drive by the, any local bank like BB&T, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and they have this bulletin board up there that say today's rate uh, of interest is such and such, usually they're not very good. Uh, so the annual percentage increase in the nominal value of the financial asset. So, yeah, 
In other words, the, 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 the number value that goes up, that's the one that people see as a nominal interest rate. Now, the one that you don't see is the real interest rate because the one that you don't see is the one that you have taken into account inflation. By taking the difference here, the nominal interest rate is the one you can see. If you subtract from it the inflation rate, then you get the real interest rate. So this is the one we're concerned about. Now, because remember we said that inflation eats away your money. Unless you have taken into account inflation, which will call it a real value. But if you don't, or you have not taken into account inflation, then it remains a nominal value. The real interest rate is an annual percentage increase in the purchasing power of the financial asset. Okay, so that's uh, the purchasing power. So the real thing, the interest rate, after you have taken into account inflation rate. So that's just an identity that you can remember. So let's look at this example here. In this example, we look at a few years, every five years, beginning from 1975 all the way to 2010. And then we're going to reapply that equation that is your little r, your real interest rate is equal to your nominal interest rate minus inflation rate. It's the same thing. So I want you to take a look very carefully. And, and you could see that for the most part, your real interest rate is positive, except for those two years. And anybody remember what those two years were? These were the two oil shocks years. So I'm going to write down the first oil shock, which I've talked about it in, uh, I think, in the last lecture. It was during the early 70s. And then the second oil shock is happened in the late 70s. The first one was uh, happened because of something called a young, young people's uh, war. So this is a Jewish uh, holiday. The nations of Israel were, was attacked by the Arab League nations. So there was an oil, and, and that resulted in some sort of uh, oil embargo. Very famous incident or event. If you read your history, economic history, you definitely will see that. Interesting, though. Um, I think they make a lot of movies out of it. Well, not as many movies as this one. The late some of these was about the um, the country of Iran uh, became more than I, well, no, the other way, excuse me. Uh, it was, uh, it used to be run by a very modern king. We call him the Shah, you know, he was like, considered a friend of America, Amer Americans. Uh, so the country is very um, modernized. Women uh, don't have to wear this veil and all that, you know. So they were very modern looking, you know. They could wear dresses and don't have to cover up so much. And, and then something happened. Okay, the a group of, well, the religious fanatic took over um, the country of Iran, and then overnight the country's changed. So a lot of intellectuals escaped and came to the U.S. Uh, because they know they will face some sort of persecution if their friends are Americans. So the, the Shah, the king of Iran, also escaped. I think he escaped to the U.S. somewhere. I forgot where, but... Um, so overnight, the country became like a, a Muslim fanatic country. And so the whole bunch of uh, Islamic fanatic uh, students took over the American embassy. And I think they took a whole bunch of hostages. I forgot how many. So it was, uh, they have been captured for a little bit more than a year, 400 some days. So that's more than a, a little bit more than a year. And during that time was during Jimmy Carter's administration. And so, and after Jimmy Carter, the next president was Ronald Reagan. So he was sworn in in January of 1980. So this is late 70. Reagan was uh, sworn 
in as the president of the United States, and uh, and he got the and the hostages were released just minute after he he was sworn in, so he got the credit instead of uh, President Jimmy Carter got the credit. So there was quite a bit of stories behind that, and because you know there were a lot of movies made uh, for this incident as well. So these two oil shocks here are the seventy five eighty right there. Okay. So you can see that for these two years, the, in, uh, the inflation rate is extremely high, 9.1 versus 13.5. So much so that they are higher than the nominal interest rate. So therefore, you get a negative number because inflation rates are higher for these two years than the nominal interest rate. So therefore, the real interest rate is actually negative. Whereas if you look at all other years, Consistently, you see nominal interest rate being higher than inflation rate. So therefore, after you do the subtraction, the number is positive. Uh, that's what we expect, except for this turbulent use of the, the two oil shocks use. So now you get some idea, and now we translate, like, translate that table into a graph. So this is what it looks like. And again, you could see this two years right there, 1980, there about, 1975, there about, and this is a zero, so you got two negative real interest rate there. So the, the rest of the time you see positive interest rate, except for, this is kind of like coming close, 2010, uh, about 2011, somewhere there, we had a deflation almost, that is negative inflation, and you could see that it dipped down to real interest rate is actually pretty close to zero, and then after zero is negative. So that's interesting. Um, next, uh, we want to go back to this concept about unexpected inflation, like who get affected. So again, we talked about earlier that unexpected inflation will benefit the borrowers people who borrow money, people like us who borrow money for to pay off our house. So you take out mortgages and then you have your old bank, your monthly mortgages goes to the bank. So by the time the bank gets it, you know, they get hurt because the values are less because that's where the money flow from us to them. However, I also have mentioned earlier that the bankers are always uh, one step ahead of us. So what they do is, if they see inflation coming, so if you see it coming, it's no longer unexpected, it will be considered as expected. So as it turns out, if it is inflation is expected, it may not hurt the bankers or the lenders if they can adjust the nominal interest rate, and which is what they do a lot of time. So if they adjust it and you know, they are one step ahead of us, so by the time we send the money to them, you know, you know they, 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 they're not being hurt by it because they have already adjusted, they've already corrected it. So the last thing I will talk about in this chapter is uh, something known as a Fisher effect. Now the word Fisher, of course, is named after the last name of, of the economies who found this theory or discovered this uh, patterns or phenomenon, economic phenomenon. So what he discovered was that, well, you know, every time your nominal interest rate is high, you also will have high inflation rate. And every time it's low, you also will have low inflation rate. So take a look. So there it is. Now, the blue line that you see is the nominal interest rate. And the red line you see is the inflation rate. So in other words, it is the difference between, this is a blue line, nominal interest rate, and inflation rate is your red line. So the difference between it is your real interest rate. So as you can see, every time the blue line is higher than the red line, which is when your real interest rate is positive. Now, there were two years, remember we mentioned, like, see right here? where the blue line is actually, so the red line, which is your inflation rate is actually higher. And again, that corresponds to your early 70s, well, mid 70s now, the first and the second oil shock in the 80s. 
So this was the unusual years for inflation because inflation for those two years were extraordinary high. So what happened here is you could see that, oh, wow, your nominal interest rate is actually, well, excuse me, your inflation rate, uh, rate, which is a red line, is actually higher than your nominal interest rate for this year. So it's above it, above the blue line for this. Whereas the rest of the time, you know, the blue line is above the, the red line, looking across like that. So that's your Fisher effects. So once again, Fisher effects says uh, what he found. He said, whoa, you know, I discovered this phenomenon. Every time your nominal interest rate is high, inflation rate is also high. But if it is low, it is also low. So you can kind of like see the pattern, you know. Uh, see, like there's a dip here, there's a dip here. And the peak there, and then it drops. And so more or less the same pattern in general. And uh, that's uh, all I have to say for this uh, chapter six. So again, thank you for coming and uh, for listening and we'll move on to the next chapter in the next lecture. Thank you.